It's on, it's on, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, welcome back. So uh, the first speaker this morning session is Subir Sashdi from Harvard. Uh, the title, well, I mean, I don't think that's the title, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, people talk about the uh, SYK related uh, uh, stuff. Okay. All right, well, uh, thank you, Chen Kei. It's, uh, it's really nice to be part of this very warm uh, and loving memorial for Xu Cheng. It was really very nice uh, event last night. Um, I. Uh, I mean, I'm roughly a contemporary of Xu Cheng. We started in physics around the same time. Uh, and I've known him since the beginning parts of my career. Uh, and in our early days, our interaction uh, was in the context of uh, high temperature superconductivity. Uh, the younger people in the audience won't, probably don't realize that the whole culture of high TC then was very, very different. Uh, <laughs> we just loved to attack each other. and. Uh, so many of us are working, huh? Sorry. <laughs> no, but we, you know, we became great friends as a result. <laughs> uh, anyway, so many of us were thinking about various formulations of different order parameters and competing order parameters, and now sometimes called intertwined order parameters, which is not exactly the same thing. Uh, and then Xu Cheng suddenly out of the blue wrote this very beautiful paper, which uh, in very characteristic Xu Cheng style, uh, formulated this set of ideas in a, you know, a really elegant way with emphasis on symmetry in a way that captured imagination of not only the theorists, but also the experimentalists. And uh, so there was a lot of work on, uh, you know, uh, on understanding this and its limitation of this theory. And, uh, and it really became part of uh, uh, you know, our understanding of high TC. Of course, this high TC situation is extremely complicated, uh, but this was, uh, I think, a very important uh, stepping point uh, in the early days. So, uh, fortunately, I, I this, uh, you know, so Xu Cheng and I were in any intense, intense discussions, and, uh, you know, we got along despite our differences of opinion, and uh, I learned to appreciate uh, his elegant style and insight into experiments. Uh, and this was actually a, the, my one paper with Chu Cheng, uh, where we wrote a comment about uh, experiments, neutron scattering experiments on uh, vortex lattices. So this is a picture of a vortex lattice, and this is some picture of a spin resonance mode. It's spatial, spatial variation. Uh, anyway, so, okay. Uh, so, but the SO5 symmetry, you know, itself was a great way to unify many ideas, but I, I, I don't think it really appeared as a final, you know, one couldn't point to a, a specific point in the phase diagram where the symmetry was really uh, essentially exact. Uh, so I just want to mention here a very different problem, which one of my regrets is I never had a chance to present this to Xu Cheng in great detail. Uh, this is a different problem of a frustrated antiferromagnet uh, where you, as you change the frustration on the square lattice, you go from the nail state uh, with broken spin rotation symmetry. So he, here the order parameter is a three component vector. Uh, and, on, and on this side, instead of having a superconductor, uh, you have a valence bond solid. So the spins form singlets and the singlets orient themselves in some direction. And to describe this state, you need a two component vector, Vx and Vy sort of the analog of the superconducting auto parameter of SO5. Uh, and for this model, uh, near its critical point, there's now actually very good evidence of an emergent, yeah. precisely the same SO5 symmetry that uh, Xu Cheng talked about between these five components, which initially seem to be uh, unrelated to each other. Uh, the mechanism here is rather subtle, and I won't go into it. Uh, has to do with various complicated berry phase effects. and actually very much these hedgehog instantons that Daniel Arovas talked about, when you properly account for them in the end, the SO5 symmetry seems to emerge. So that's a very nice story, which, uh, I would, which, is, start, which is only coming together in the last few years, uh, but never had a chance to discuss that with Xu Cheng. Okay, so now let me turn to my own talk. Um, so this is work primarily with my uh, 
uh, well, he's no longer a student. He got his thesis degree a month ago, Avesh Patel. He's going to be at Berkeley uh, as a Miller Fellow uh, in a couple of months. All right, so uh, this is a theoretical work on what, you know, following many experiments, it's called a Planckian metal. And one of the things we have done with this work is uh, have a theory of a metal which has linear interior resistivity, but also has some signs of a large Fermi surface. Okay, so let me just quickly recall the theory of ordinary metals. Uh, so ordinary metals can be described by essentially a Newtonian theory with a little bit of quantum mechanics. Uh, and the equilibration time or the collision time of quasi-particles uh, vanishes as one over temperature squared, diverges as one over temperature squared. And it's also proportional to the inverse interaction strength squared, U. Uh, and if you take a Drude theory, you get this kind of resistivity, which has two important properties. One, it's because it's T squared, and the other is the magnitude of the T squared resistivity depends on the strength of the interactions. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, so this time, uh, I will note, is much longer uh, than what's now called the Planckian time, which is a, the only time you can make out of uh, temperature and H bar. Uh, and this is also the time for relaxation of waves on a black hole, which hence this Planckian metal here. Unfortunately, you should make this coin out of IBCO and then this would be a true Planckian metal. <laughs> okay, so my talk is about many recent observations of what people are calling Planckian metals uh, in cuprates, nictides, graphene, and also ultra crawl atoms, uh, where if you the resistivity has two important characteristics. One, first of all, it's linear in temperature, uh, as you, when you combine these formulae. And secondly, if you write it in this form, and experimentally have some ways of measuring M star and N, uh, quite reliably, uh, then using those values, you can read off a value of tau. And what you find then uh, is that not only is one over tau linear in temperature, but the coefficient here is pretty close to one, and independent apparently of any strength of interactions because you get the same coefficient in many different systems. So, uh, so these are the different systems. I've already mentioned uh, several recent papers by different groups. Uh, and this is a paper from the Thai Fair group uh, where they've looked at a whole bunch of materials and looked at this number alpha multiplied one over tau. And you can so as see it's pretty close to one. So this is the mystery uh, of the Planckian metal. Somebody called this the Kepler problem. So these are the problems. How do you get resistivity like this uh, with a number here when written this way of order one? Uh, so I agree this is a, you know, uh, a central mystery of high TC. I'm not going to solve it, uh, but I'll give you a model which can give something like this, okay, which I hope is a step in the right direction. So the model is built out of what people are calling the SYK model. So, this, so at its bare bones, it's just a model of electrons with many orbital labels alpha, which go from one through n. Uh, all the electrons have the same energy epsilon, so they degenerate as far as the single particle energy is concerned. But they have uh, an arbitrary two-body interaction, all-to-all -all interactions, which are independent random numbers. So the main important thing is that these are independent random numbers. Uh, so this problem, despite being a strongly interacting problem, can be solved exactly in the limit as the number of these orbitals uh, goes to infinity. So the solution you find um, has the following basic characteristic. If you look at the propagator of any electron, the local uh, propagator, uh, it falls off as one over square root of time. Uh, that's in contrast to the one over time that you get for a Fermi liquid or any system with quasi-particles. Um, and furthermore, it also, and this is going to play an important role in everything I talk about, it has a particle hole asymmetry, uh, this, which is characterized by this number capital E, uh, and is written this way for reasons I won't go into. Uh, so E is just some, capital E is a dimensionless number, which tells you the difference between the propagation of a particle and a hole. And it should be clear that this number is just simply determined by this epsilon. So when epsilon is zero, the whole thing is particle hole symmetric, and capital E is zero. And for small epsilon, you might expect uh, capital E is proportional to epsilon, and that does indeed turn out to be the case. Uh, now epsilon is dimensionful, 
So to get this dimensional of number capital E, uh, then to small epsilon, you get an equation like this. Capital E is some number C times epsilon over U. So this number C uh, is a UV sensitive number. It depends a, quite a bit on the details of the model and what you put at high energies. Uh, but then that's, and that's really all. It'll turn out to play an important role in my discussion. So just, so these are, <laughs> this is really all you need to remember about the solution of the SYK model. Okay, so you could take the solution and it turns out you can extend it to finite temperature. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful conformal invariance properties and you can compute the, uh, the Green's function at finite temperature. So there's many things I want to emphasize here. Uh, first, let's look at it at the particle hole symmetric case where epsilon is zero, so that E is also zero. Then not surprisingly, you get a particle hole symmetric Green's function uh, what else? The width of this uh, is of order temperature. So the axis here is omega over T. So at least the electronic Green's function has some universal Planckian dynamics. Uh, you know, in a Fermi liquid, this width would be uh, temperature squared and also proportional strength of the interaction. Here the interaction strength doesn't appear. Uh, the only place the interaction strength appears is in this prefactor C, it's one over square root of U. Uh, and uh, so that's the only dependence on interaction. And also this thing at small large omega falls off as one over square root of omega, which is just a Fourier transform of the one over square root of tau. Uh, and that will also be important. In fact, all these features will be important in what I present. So now if you change the value of epsilon, you get another solution. Uh, so for example, when epsilon is positive, um, you get a p something peaked at positive energy, so this is a particle-like solution, this is a hole-like solution, uh, but the dispersion here is of order epsilon times kT, sorry, capital E times kT, so it's, 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 the dispersion therefore is not, if you think of epsilon as somehow some momentum dependent uh, quantity, uh, then the effective mass is quite heavy, it's determined by the temperature. Okay, so that's the solution of the SYK model. Uh, so it's just a particle just sitting around with interacting with each other with, uh, with uh, lots of, uh, with random interaction. So now we want to make, make something that moves around and compute resistance. Um, so this is the plain SYK model. So we want to give this, these electrons some other label. So we're going to think of alpha, beta, gamma, delta as some orbital labels. Uh, say for the nictides, there's five orbitals, so five is infinity and so on. Okay, but Really, this large N is just a theoretical tool for picking out a certain set of graphs. You could equally well do these graphs for N equals one. Um, all right, so we want to put another label. So we'll call that label K. So that will be momentum, no doubt. So now, now the quasi-particles have some, in the incipient quasi-particles have some dispersion epsilon of K. Uh, and this interaction could also depend on K. And I'll present various models for this interaction. That's where all the action will be. Uh, now, if you take this model, uh, and many variants of these have these been studied over the years, uh, what you find uh, generally is that once you have a dispersion, all this nice Planckian behavior disappears, uh, and you get Fermi liquid behavior at low enough energies. Uh, so, you know, somewhat nicely, of nice property of this Fermi liquid behavior uh, is the, you know, appears below W squared over U, where W is the bandwidth of epsilon K, uh, which, is, uh, which is nice. Naively, you might have thought it's W, uh, any dispersion will do, but actually it gets renormalized down to W squared over U, but below this energy, you get uh, Fermi liquid behavior. Uh, so one specific model that's been studied by uh, this particular model, starting with uh, Peng Fei Zhang and also Leon Balance's group, uh, is the following model where you take a lattice, uh, each little island here is the SYK model, uh, and there's a hopping between the sites, uh, which is, in this case, I just take to be the same. Uh, and it's a hopping diagonal in the, in the uh, orbital label. Okay, so this particular model in the limit of large n can be solved, exactly. Uh, and what you find, as I said earlier, um, is this kind of Planckian behavior in this intermediate temperature regime doesn't happen all the way down to zero temperature. 
And in this temperature regime, if you compute the resistivity, uh, you find it's linear in T. So that's all very exciting, and uh, maybe we can start declaring victory. But there are, so that's good progress, but there are some problems with this solution. First of all, in this regime, we have linear resistivity. There's no Fermi surface. In fact, the Green's function is just completely local. And that does not accord with many experiments. We definitely see some signs of a Fermi surface. Uh, and secondly, uh, well, th there's three problems. One, then the coefficient of linear resistivity certainly depends on u in a rather explicit way. So there's no, no sense in which this is going to be universal. And finally, this resistance in the regime where it's valid is always much bigger than h over e squared in two dimensions. Uh, so, so that's also not in accord with many experiments. People see linear resistivity down to much lower resistivity, uh, not just in this bad metal regime. So, so this model, you know, it's a good model of a high temperature bad metal. Maybe it, it's a reasonable starting point for the ultra cold atom experiments, which are at really high temperature. Uh, but it's, it can't explain the most recent YBCO experiment for sure. Um, so there's another model that people have looked at in this vein. We take a two-band model or a condo lattice model. So you have a bunch of local complicated atoms, each described by SYK. Uh, these are the uh, F fermions. And then you have a conduction fermion which move around. And they have some condo exchange with these localized fermions. So in this case, the SYK model just acts like a heat bath of scatterers, which your, your conduction electrons can scatter off. Uh, and when you do this, you find that these conduction electrons C behave like a marginal Fermi liquid, and they do indeed have a linear resistivity. So that's good, uh, but this model really is essentially the same as Chandra's original model, except that we're giving a little more uh, detail on where this scattering comes from, from the SYK islands. Uh, in fact, this model is effectively mentioned in my 1993 paper. Um, but this again has problems. Uh, one problem is, of course, the coefficient of linear resistivity now depends on the condo exchange interaction. But the bigger problem is that the Fermi surface is small. So we just, you know, we just have this bath of scatterers, which are some magic electron given to us, but they're not part of the Fermi surface. And uh, that's also not in agreement with experiments. We need all the electrons to participate. Uh, and there are various holographic models of the MIT, uh, Leiden, there's Jan is not here, <laughs> of the approach, which essentially have the same features. <coughs> and I think are unsatisfactory for, this, for these reasons I just mentioned. Okay, so I want to fix all these problems. <laughs> all right, uh, so what, uh, let me first go back to the first uh, model here, the uh, Song et al. model from Santa Barbara. Uh, which I just described. But let me now write it in momentum space. Uh, let me just uh, take this IJ label and convert it to a momentum label. Uh, and then you get the moment dispersion of these quasi-particles with some interactions. Okay. Uh, and for the case where these interactions are random on every site, uh, then the two-point correlator of this interaction uh, looks something like this. It just got a overall momentum conservation term, which makes it translationally invariant on average. Okay, so this is the mo model that we want to deform a little bit. This is what gives you this incoherent metal, which is also a bad metal because the resistivity is too large, and the resistivity depends on the interaction strength, uh, and so on. So it's not what's being seen in the latest experiments. Um, all right, so, uh, what are we going to change this? So we are going to think of this as, you know, we, the problem with these models is that they just completely destroy the Fermi surface. So we want to soften the interaction. You don't want to make it as strong as it is. Uh, and, and we have, want to have some quasi-particle around at least for a little while. So here's what we're going to do. So we imagine the following. So here's some quasi-particle interaction U between quasi-particles carrying momenta. Uh, and what we're going to say is every time uh, these, uh, this process doesn't conserve total energy, we view that as a virtual process, a non-resident process. And we account for it by kind of integrating it out in some way. 
I'm not going to actually do it, but this is the hand-waving part of the talk. But these are the key slides. Uh, and so I'm going to assume that all these non-resonant processes uh, have already been accounted for in the value of the dispersion. So they have these quasi-particles which have non-resonant interactions with each other, and those have just been, all they do is renormalize the quasi-particle dispersion. So we're going to throw these interactions out. So what we get then is what I, we're calling the resonant SYK model. We're only going to keep interaction that conserve total energy. All virtual processes will be just ignored or assumed to have been accounted for by renormalization of the dispersion in the first place, uh, which seems like a reasonable thing because that's how people define M star by some renormalized uh, dispersion, dispersing interaction. So we only keep the resonant interaction. Now this kind of procedure you know, would be completely standard uh, and in control, uh, it's any time you had kind of sort of a gap separating low energy state from high energy states. I mean, it's what we do uh, when we write on the super exchange model for the TJ model from the Hubbard model. We just integrate out some high energy states, treat them virtually, and you get some low energy theory. Five minutes left. Okay. The so the only thing I'm doing that's, uh, that's not permitted or dangerous is I'm doing this kind of procedure in a gapless system. I'm just taking all, dividing the interaction to two types, non-resonant and resonant, and I just ignore the non-resonant, apart from renormalization. All right, so then this is the model, that's it. So I can, you take the same, uh, some quasi-particle interacting with some random interaction, and the random interaction has the feature uh, that we only include the resonant parts. Okay, amazing, you can now solve this exactly. That's the, so the, this is the only new thing here, this resonance condition. Uh, you can solve this exactly, and what you find, first of all, that uh, this kind of Planckian behavior with conformal solutions all, holds all the way down to zero temperature. So the Green's function uh, is now uh, essentially the SYK Green's function, and what happens as a function of momentum is that this particle symmetry parameter changes in this exactly the same way. So this is what I showed you as the solution of the SYK model. So this, uh, so, and why does this true? Okay, this is just quickly. Uh, for those of you who know, the Green's function in time has this form. The only thing particle hole asymmetry does gives this exponential factor. And now what you want is this exponential factors at this vertex should cancel. And you find that they do indeed cancel provided you conserve energy. Uh, and, and that's the reason you've got a Planckian metal solution all the way down to zero temperature. And, and this, these set of plots I showed you for the SYK model as a function of this energy epsilon are now nothing but the dispersion that you will see in photoemission uh, crossing the Fermi surface. Here's the Fermi surface. Of course, there's no actual Fermi surface. Everything is very broad uh, at finite temperature uh, and also down to zero temperature. There's no delta function anywhere. Uh, but there is a remnant Fermi surface, hence we're calling remnant. Okay. All right, so now you could take this model and compute the resistivity by just a Kubo formula. And now what happens is a bit of magic. Uh, there's two different places the interaction appears. Uh, one place is in the Green's function. There's a one over U from interaction Green's function squared. And there's an interaction in the fact that epsilon, capital E, sorry, here, uh, there's an interaction strength here. There's, an in, there's a U over there. So when I integrate over the dispersion, uh, the Green's function depends on capital epsilon, capital E, you'll pick up a factor of, of U. So when you put that all together, and you just do this integral, you get an answer that's totally independent of U. And precisely this coefficient M star over any e squared appears, where M star is this particular number, which you can construct from the dispersion. This is true in any, any dimension. Uh, and for a quadratically dispersing Fermi surface, this is exactly M star. And for others, it's slightly different anyway. So this is the quantity you get, where epsilon k is this renormalized dispersion. And the coefficient is 2.71 c, where c is a number that appears here. So really, you've reduced everything to determination of c. Uh, now, c is determined by some UV physics. It really depends on exactly what type of interaction you take in momentum space. Typically, you want an interaction which is resonant but has a width of order W sub U, and there's some weak dependence. And I wish I wanted to show you a plot of that, but we haven't quite got that ready yet. Uh, anyway, but there's a simple limit 
uh, where W sub U is zero, where you make everything just in the, uh, in electrons only interact with other electrons with the same energy. That's, that's not what we, that's not the same as resonance is a stronger condition, but there it's completely solvable uh, and you get 1.1 kT over H bar. So anyway, so that's the end of my talk. So, so what I've given you is a simple model of strongly interacting electrons with a remnant Fermi surface, which has the property, first of all, that the characteristic dissipation or relaxation time is just this Planckian time. Uh, and we have a model which has a solution which, uh, which has many nice features, one of which is that it's a compressible system at any density, uh, and it's also dispersive with Planckian dynamics down to t equals zero. And I really don't know of any, anything else that satisfies these properties. Uh, and this resonance condition is supported by our RG argument, uh, and this realizes a Planckian metal uh, where M star is defined by the dispersion of EK, and we indeed find to pretty good accuracy of resistance of exactly of this type. Uh, and uh, okay, so the, and finally the reason there's a black hole here, the same theory also describes a large set of charged black holes in Einstein Maxwell theory in four dimensions at low temperatures, uh, but you can look at this paper for that. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, yeah. uh, uh, Chalmi first. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so uh, you, you add another delta function in the UU correlation. Yeah, right? that's, so that's all we did. Right, but that seemed to change the dimensionality of U compared Correct. to the previous version. So does it mean that it has some interesting time dependent feature? No, I mean, you, you, it's all a question of how you define U. Uh, you know, I mean, there's two different U's, but it's the same U that appears in both places and it cancels out. If that U appeared in the answer, I'd be in trouble. Right. But it cancels out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I'd have to figure out how to define it. I mean, so it's true if I just picked out the resonant interaction, that's a set of measure zero. So what I've really done is I, I, I'm taking some finite measure strength there. And I've kind of, if you wish, I've taken slightly some of the non-resonant interactions, squeezed them down to resonant, and the other ones, and I've most pushed them to infinity. And that's kind of the procedure. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so can I understand the reminiscence of the Fermi surface as coming from some sort of Luttinger theorem because your random interaction now also respects translational symmetry? Yeah, so there is, that is, if you s there is a Luttinger theorem here where, uh, which actually relates this particle hole asymmetry to the total charge density. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so, so there's a way to define a generalization of the Luttinger theorem for this state. And which would be absent if you don't have this resonance condition. Uh, well, what would happen if you didn't have the resonant condition, then at low enough temperature, it'd become a Fermi liquid. Okay. There's no way to avoid that. Uh, this is the only way I know of to avoid it. So this was, uh. this was the key thing here. So this, you know, so when, what happens is that if you, when you have some dispersion, you get these exponential factors. And typically, the exponential factors on these three lines don't agree with the one here. So that's what would happen in the Song et al. solution. So when you look at what's going on here, you find that there's no solution that's conformal. So you break conformal invariance and flow into a resonance. But here, what we're saying is that uh, if you impose this resonance condition, which is just justified by this RG hand-waving argument, uh, it gives you a mechanism of preserving uh, the conformal solution to much lower temperatures, where the resistance is no longer much bigger than H over E squared. And a bonus, it's also independent of the standard interactions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, what about if you go to high temperatures where the temperature is bigger than the bandwidth? Is there any Oh, very, that high. Well, just yeah. not yeah. because it's physically relevant, but because we know how to solve problems. In right. right, yeah, I believe you still get a linear temperature dependence there, but it's uh, highly non-universal, yeah. I guess the question is what happens to the compressibility? The, uh, the oh yeah. Star. Okay, I don't know off the top of my head. I think that might be somewhere in Leon's paper. I don't remember. Yeah, sorry. Good question. Yeah. So, sorry, is this working? Yeah, yeah. So, Subir, suppose, suppose this is right, okay? <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being serious now because this is a physics okay. question, not a math question. So suppose. Please. You've got it right. This is a very weird onsatz where you have thrown away 
all the off-shale scatterings. Uh, I don't know how to get there logically from starting from microscopics, but never mind. Suppose, suppose that's right. Well, what's going on? In other words, we, we st is I'm in the camp that thinks that this behavior is critical and that there's you're, you're on the knife edge of a continuous phase transition of some kind. Maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, but is there any, do you have any logical link between, between this ansatz and what might be going on collectively in the, at, the, at this alleged uh, phase transition? Well, so this state is also a critical state. It's a critical line, if you wish. Uh, and, but if you relax this resonant condition, then at low enough temperatures, you flow into a regular Fermi liquid, at least in this formulation. No, no, I know. So what's uh, going on? What's going on? Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, so, um, I mean, of course, the model as written, you know, looks, looks kind of strange. But really, the reason we're writing these strange models is, uh, is so that we can take a certain large end limit. Now, the large end limit gives you a certain set of graphs that you have to, to sum. Now, I could have equally well said, uh, I'm just going to sum these graphs for the Hubbard model. Could have said I'm going to do that. Uh, and, you know, at least mathematically, that'd be equally valid procedure because who cares about this large end limit and these random interactions. Uh, but the point is that when you have the large end limit, it, it really, it gives you many nice properties, like the whole scaling structure, the conformal invariance, all of that comes out very elegantly, and you can see why it's coming out. Whereas if you just sum some graph, you had no idea. You would have no idea how this would all work. And the Luttinger theorem works and things like that. Uh, so how do we check this? Well, I don't you know. That's, of course, the important question. I don't have an answer, good answer. Right now, I'm working with Antoine George, where they have these multi-site DMFT solutions. And there's quite a wide temperature range where this stuff agrees with the DMFT. So we're trying to build with that and see if we can figure out what's going on to lower temperatures. But at this point, you should just view this as an ansatz, which has all the properties that are required by the experiment. So this is the best. Just looking at the experiments, there's all these features which are very rigid. And believe me, I've tried hundreds of other models. This is the one that works best. <laughs> I lose the floor. If this is actually what's happening, then it's very deep because I can't think of any, myself, any logical path that takes you to annihilate all the off-shell scatterings. So, so I think the way, the way to think about it is, you know, suppose I take the Hubbard model, then there's states of order one and the state of order u, and I just integrate out the u. What I'm doing here uh, is I have a whole continuum of states. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, some low energy states and shrink them down exactly onto resonance. And the high energy state, I'm going to move them to infinity. Now, that procedure is not something the large end uh, approach tells me to do. The large end doesn't do that. So I'm supplementing the large end with that kind of RG inspired procedure. That's the best I can say. <laughs> Uh, uh, I should know the answer. I'm pretty sure it does work, but with a different uh, number. Just it won't be pi squared over three or whatever it is. It'll be some other number. But we haven't done it. Uh, Avishkar might know. <laughs> I don't remember. But I'm pretty sure it, it will be a Wiedemann-Franz-like law here, but with a different number. 